Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. It's quite remarkable how time flies, but that would not make us forget the charismatic contribution of lovely legendary ladies like Virginia Mayo. By way of intro, you can call her an American film actress and dancer, but her versatility on screen is quite amazing and exceptionally worthy of recognition. She is the cute box office hit of the 1940s, the blonde and green-eyed lady who rose from being a decorative Goldwyn girl to a top comedy musical star. She interestingly enjoyed faithful and scandal-free marriage. How was Virginia Mayo annoyed by Gary Cooper's stalking? It may not be out of place to say Virginia Mayo is the queen of comedy musicals of her time, a highly energetic lady. She is one of those. I could bet my dollar that if given the right wing, they would always fly, regardless of the weather. My opinion comes from the dynamic nature of her creativity. Her personality is such that could fit into almost all movie roles, as we saw her excite her audience in those series of comedy films. She is no doubt among the most beautiful screen stars of the era, with her natural blonde, Mayo progressed from being one of the decorative Goldwyn girls to becoming a major screen sensation. Her dancing was so unique that she danced her way into several Hollywood film musicals and demonstrated as an excellent foil for the likes of Bob Hope and Danny Kaye. In case you have not heard much about Virginia Mayo, it's probably because you are too young when she was doing her stint. I noticed that her name always pops up while reading the history of some of the major producers and actors of the times, plus the classic films that immortalised her. I'm wondering now if you have heard about Flaxie Martin and Smart Girls Don't Talk. For her remarkable creativity, Mayo would be remembered for her most heartless roles, that of a dishonest wife in the best years of our lives, and one as a shrewish mole of James Cagney's gangster in White Heat. Regardless of her ambitious and lively career, Mayo still had time to take care of her home and kept faith with her husband. Recall that she married once and remained in marriage till transition to eternal glory. Mayo was one of those actresses that began performance in vaudeville and grew into a remarkable dramatic character, but her versatile talent made it difficult to identify her with a typecast or a particular genre. Mayo's blonde prettiness is the type that obsessed a lot of men, despite a minor squint. That was why she became Danny Kaye's fantasy girl in four of Samuel Goldwyn Technicolor musicals in the early part of her career, before she moved to Warner's. With Warner's, Mayo continued her runs, starring in tepid but melodic trivia, where she exuded an inadequate but decorative style. She was born Virginia Cara Jones, is a native of St. Louis. She got an acting and dancing lesson at her aunt's dramatic school and was said to have started her entertainment journey as a child. Growing under an entertainment family, Little Jones, Mayo's birth name, appeared in her brother-in-law's post-Vaudeville Vaudeville performance and became known as the Mayo Brothers for about three years, showing in comedy sketches alongside two men in a horse costume. That was where she derived her name, Mayo. She grew up and made it her stage name. While that act was ongoing, very few knew the innate talent in young Mayo until she began her shows. Mayo appeared in several remarkable films with Who Is Who's in the industry. I still remember one she did with Ronald Reagan, the girl from Jones Beach, and Captain Horatio Hornblower with Gregory Peck. That was how her name and talent mingled with several notable Hollywood leading men, because of her adaptability to different roles. Mayo Broadway shows did not escape the records as we saw her outstanding performance in Eddie Cantor's Broadway hit show Banjo Eyes in 1941. This legendary beauty and brain were like a goldfish as she showed excellent interpretation of costume epics, westerns, gangster movies and those beautiful comic films that portrayed her as a limitless talent. Not very much is said about her early life, but it seems she spent the greater part of her girlish childhood dancing and singing, since she started learning the act from the age of six. She may have also been raised in some form of guided parenting under her journalist father Luke and his wife Martha Henrietta.
and by the time she left high school in 1937, it did not take long before she landed her first professional acting and dancing contract at the St. Louis Municipal Opera Theatre, where she began performing alongside six other girls at the Hotel Jefferson. It was Andy Mayo who picked special interest in her and soon drafted her in for his act, Morton and Mayo. While Mayo was touring the American Vaudeville Trail, playing the role of a ringmaster and Pansy the Horse's foil with Morton, and doing shows that Samuel Goldwyn had spotted her at, Billy Rose's Diamond Horseshoe nightclub around Broadway Theatre District. Working with Sam Goldwyn was not much of a big deal, but Mayo had much to show for it. She was happy about the contract. Sam Goldwyn gave her a five-year contract, with very little salary as a beginner. The pay was equivalent to what an average new talent would want to hang on with. Beginning with a hundred dollars a week salary was just enough to keep her happy, as she anticipated a breakthrough. Mayo didn't mind about the pay. I knew I had to pay my dues in this industry and work hard if I wanted fame and fortune, she explained, especially when the economy of the time was harsh on people following the Depression, and everyone needed something to keep body and soul going. But there was one other hurdle she had to cross. Her beauty infatuated Goldwyn so much that he kept pestering her. I had Sam Goldwyn hanging around my neck, like that dead albatross in the rhyme of the ancient mariner, she was quoted. What he did not know was that a more determined Mayo is not the kind of newbie you can fool around with. She has her beauty in place, her talent and her future to focus on. If my memory serves me right, I should say that was the reason he never gave her much opportunity earlier, rather resulting in loaning her out to other studios that decided to use her the way they wanted. But for Mayo, the situation helped her to build and diversified her creativity. His constant harassment would toughen me up, she narrated. Perhaps if David O. Selznick had given her a pass mark when she did a screen test at MGM, she would not have entered Goldwyn's enclave. But that is not the end of the story, because nothing good comes easy in life. Appearing as one of the Goldwyn girls was enough to expose her to the rest of the studios, but before then he gave her a small speaking role in Jack London in 1943. The production starred Michael O'Shea, the man she would spend the rest of her life with. Maybe I should say the love of her life, O'Shea and Mayo fell in love, and four years after cemented their relationship in holy matrimony, that survived all the Hollywood storms enduring till fate intervened. That union also produced their daughter, Mary. Before then, Mayo continued her ambitious career struggle, as transformed from one of the Goldwyn girls to Bob Hope's co-star as seen in The Princess and the Pirate. Observers say she appeared ravishing in colour, with a laudable comic charisma. Not too long, Mayo began co-starring with Bing Crosby, meaning that Hope just lost a cute co-star. Hope later acknowledges his loss by saying, I knocked myself out for nine reels. Bit player from Paramount comes over and gets the girl. He added that it will be the last film I do for Goldwyn, and he kept his word. Shortly after, Goldwyn played Mayo and Danny Kaye in Wonder Man, and of course her popularity was on the increase. After appearing as Kaye's daydreams in The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, this beautiful lady is already the crush of several male admirers. She had thousands of distant fans who may have flooded her fan page with love lyrics. Her long legs, voluptuous body and her creamy complexion made many male cinema-goers salivate romantically. One of her remarkable distant admirers who could not hide his fantasies is the Sultan of Morocco, who was said to have sent Mayo a fan mail describing her as tangible proof for the existence of God. What a way to be romantic! One more brilliant decision came from Goldwyn when he decided to cast Mayo against her image as the dream girl next door in The Best Years of Our Lives. Her performance was so excellent that several years after her demise, people still refer to the unsympathetic faithless wife of Donna Andrews, a role Mayo perfectly interpreted. Apart from her all-encompassing career success, Mayo also showed that she is a believer in matrimony, and she happens to be a one-man woman, as seen in her marriage with O'Shea. Mayo was 26 when she married O'Shea, even though they did not date him that long they married. She was not the dating type, but was smart enough to discern who the right man was, 
as such, did not hesitate to move into marriage with him. Frankly, I just didn't much like most men, she had said, but O'Shea passed her test. Mayo noted that she always dreamed of marrying a perfect man, saying, They have to be perfect for me to have an interest. She once recalled how Gary Cooper chased her around in his big expensive car within the huge outdoor studio areas that Goldwyn built. I would turn and glare at him and wonder, she would be like, what on earth is he doing that for? On each of these occasions, she said, I'd just keep on walking and he'd keep on driving behind me. From his magnificent convertible car, Cooper would openly stalk Mayo. As she takes her stride down to her destination, the car rumbled behind. At some point, the sound would become faint. She would sense that he was losing faith for that very day and would surface again to try his luck another time. Males had to have something special going for them before I'd even consider looking at them, she declared. Talking about O'Shea, the only husband she knew, and his ordeal in the entertainment industry, Mayo said he had a habit of telling directors that they couldn't even direct traffic on a one-way street, which she said did not go down well with those he worked with. She described him as kind of abrasive to movie folk, in her thinking, he enjoyed acting, but in his heart, O'Shea had always wanted to be a cop. It seems his FBI friends promised him that when they start arresting, he would not be called upon to testify for those who know about O'Shea's story. And according to her, when the issue came up, they betrayed him because he found himself testifying against the men she said were dangerous men and be pointed out as the fink. Mayo recalled passionately how O'Shea felt so bad that everyone turned against him, his so-called Hollywood friends. The first time she set her eyes on O'Shea, Mayo thought he looked so cute and instantly fell in love with him. I saw him on the set sitting there, and I thought he was kind of cute, she had confessed. After marrying him in 1947, she devoted her time to him and remained faithful in the marriage until O'Shea's demise in 1973. At a point in their marital life, rumours went around that she was seeing actor Steve Cochran, a man she met on the set of Wonder Man. After working with the handsome actor, the two became dear friends for the rest of their life until Steve died. But at the beginning of that relationship, the gossip media mistook their activities as an illicit affair. But Mayo said she loved Steve Cochran like a brother and nothing else. Steve, a tall man with a small frame, rare dark eyes, thick black eyebrows and black hair, was one of the gangster typecasts in movies, but in reality he was a perfect gentleman and directly opposite his film characters. A polite, sensitive and extremely sexy young man that women always fell head over heels for. In her words, I know there's been speculation over the years that I had an affair with Steve Cochran, but I didn't. Mayo's ten years with Warners added a lot to her inventiveness as we saw her take up fresh movie role challenges. Starting with the routine crime story, Smart Girls Don't Talk, Mayo diversified or rather upgraded to full gangster knack. She became a versatile performer, playing different roles as they came, but she might not have enjoyed some of the roles she played because her ambition and interest was primarily in making musicals. May have said the moment she was offered a more difficult role as foil to the comic Milton Berle in Always Leave Them Laughing, she used the opportunity to voice her opinion. I didn't want to do that, so I made a deal with the studio. And what was her deal? She said she added a clout to it. She told them that, It's a terrible part, but I'll do it if you let me do the musicals. And so she acted the role and they also played her in six musicals. It was a 50-50 bargain. She was very pleased with it because she particularly loved to dance. After dancing with Mayo in Brooklyn, James Cagney has this to say about her. Beautiful Virginia Mayo and I did a number that I thought was some of the best dancing we ever did. Cagney added that it's still a pleasure to him because it showed some versatility and humour, things I prize highly and always strive for. Although her career waned sometime in the 1960s, Mayo continued to perform until 1997. She also developed an interest in painting. Virginia Mayo died in 2005 of pneumonia and complications of congestive heart failure at the age of 84. 
and was laid to rest next to O'Shea in Pierce Brothers Valley Oaks Park in Westlake. But now get ready to meet Lupe Velez, Hollywood's most feared badass woman, from her captivating performances to her off-screen antics. This fiery Mexican actress blazed a trail through Tinseltown like no other.